Hey everybody, my name is Brandon and I oversee Relay Communities. And I just wanna hop on here for a couple of minutes and first of all, just, just share with you a quick welcome to you as you're in your community socials. This has actually been something that we've been planning, praying for, preparing for quite some time through the fall into the winter and now here we are in January. And we can't believe that it's actually happening. And I don't know what your gathering looks like today. I don't know if you've got five people or if you've got 25 people. But no matter what humble beginnings might look like, we honestly mean it when we say that when we look ahead to the future of where we're going as a church, what you're doing today is an integral part of that mission. Multi-generational place-based gatherings are a core facet of who we are becoming as a church. Multi-generational because we need one another and not just people who are in a similar season of life as us, but people who are in different seasons of life than us. And then place-based because as I'm gonna share in a couple of minutes, we believe that God has us where we are for a reason. So here's what I'm gonna do. Um, I, I wanna share with you the mission and then I quickly wanna unpack how Relay Communities are the place in which we get to live out that mission. And then I wanna close by just sharing with you two quick encouragements. So let's look at the mission of Relay Church. We are God's growing family, practicing kingdom life for the renewal of our city. Let me start with the first one there, God's growing family. We as human beings, we both live for and long for love. We long for it in the sense that it's something that our heart desires deeply. I was reading a book recently and the author was talking about babies. And, and essentially his argument is that the first need of a baby more than anything else is human recognition. Yes, of course, we need to be fed, we need to have our diaper changed, we need to sleep, but all those things actually just facilitate us receiving the recognition, the care, the, the loving eyes that we need. He talked about how they've done studies in which parents will stare at a baby and they'll make a neutral expression. They won't show any sort of love. And for the, uh, after a few moments, the baby will begin to um, be concerned. They'll show discomfort. And then not long after that, it will actually cause emotional distress on the baby because it is that essential to what it means to be human. And this is true for babies, yes, but of, but of course it's also true for us as adults. Think about in your life, um, or maybe in your life or in the life of someone you know, the formative power of a healthy family. Now think about on the flip side of that, the deformative power of unhealthy family. And it goes to show that family is something that we need, we crave. And scripture comes out of the gate with this amazing promise, this amazing truth. Jesus says, you are members of God's family. You have been adopted as God's children through the sacrificial love of Jesus. That if we read the New Testament honestly, we would see that number one, to be a Christian means that you cannot actually be a Christian alone. And number two, we are united by something deeper than even flesh and blood, namely the blood of Jesus. So that's something that we've been called to, to be God's family. And yet, throughout the rest of the New Testament, you find time after time, especially in Paul's letters, instructions on how to actually be God's family. It's as if the writers knew that while it's something we crave, we also need help along the journey. Think about the instructions that, that we're given to encourage one another, to bear one another's burdens, to show hospitality, to forgive and then forgive and then forgive again, that love covers a multitude of sins. These are all things that if we're being honest, we want. Like I know in my life, I want encouragement in my life but I also know that I need to be someone, the kind of person that can encourage others. And in order for me to become that person, I need a place to practice that. And this is what we see what you're doing today as. Relate communities are a place where we get to come together and declare that we are God's family. But then we also get to live that out in the week to week, day to day, um, acts of service and acts of love that we get to give to one another. So it's a place where we practice being God's growing family. Second, it's a place where we practice kingdom life. If you've been a Christian for longer than uh, like a week, <laughs> you would know that there tends to be in the life of a follower of Jesus, a gap between the life that we know we have in Jesus and the life that we know God has called us to and the life that we actually live 
at present. We know that there's a space. We know that God has called us to so much more, and yet we need a place to practice that. It's January, which means that um, for many of us, we have kind of implemented some sort of New Year's resolution. I don't know about you, um, but it's, it's quite common for people to, to come up with, you know, this is going to be New Year, New Me, or whatever it is. Uh, probably for some of you, you've already given up on your resolution for the beginning of January. But January is actually a good reminder because it reminds us, first of all, that we want to change. Right? January says that there's something in a human that we want to grow. We want to become more than who we are at present. But it also reminds us that change is difficult. We resist change at all costs. And while a New Year's resolution is difficult, as we follow Jesus, we discover that Jesus has not called us to partial life transformation. He's called us to holistic life change. He says, you are a new creation, so live as a new creation. But in order for us to become those kinds of people, we need a place to change. We need a place to grow. And I know this in my life from personal experience. Change is next to impossible when done alone. We need one another to do this well. We need a place where we can practice communal disciplines. The things that we know we, we are to walk out, and yet they're almost impossible to do alone like sharing our testimony, practicing confession, practicing forgiveness, practicing generosity, practice the, bear, uh, the bearing of burdens for other people. And when we look at that, we see Willey Communities as a place where we get to practice the kind of life that Jesus has called us to, to grow in spiritual maturity. And when we see the Church of 2030, and we see a church walking this out, we don't see a perfect one. By, by far, far, far from a perfect one, because we are human beings. So the moment a human being enters a community, it is no longer a perfect community. But we see a church that is growing and a church that is healthy. So we can't wait to practice this together. And then number three, we're God's growing family, practicing kingdom life for the renewal of our city. We here um, at Relate Church have kind of been quoting this, this quote. It comes out of a book from Rosario Butterfield called The Gospel Comes with a house, house Key. And in it, she says this amazing line. She says, God never gets the address wrong. And if you boil that down, essentially all that means is this, that God has you where you are for a reason. The place where you live is God-ordained. We actually believe that. Now, if we're being honest, for many of us, when we make choices of where we live, um, we choose it because we like the living room or we like the kitchen island or whatever it might be. I know for me, for most of my life, you know, whenever we moved or even when Ali and I moved, it wasn't based off of the area in which God called us to. It was based after, it was based after other reasons. Um, on the flip side, there's probably some of you who are thinking, God can't call, have called me where I am because my landlord is rude and my dishwasher is broken and it's far from perfect. And I actually believe that God cuts through both of those. And he says, in spite of the reasons why we think we live where we are, I have a reason for placing you in, in, in the area, in the neighborhood, in the city that you live in. Jesus has called us to be a faithful presence to our neighborhood. In Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he says to us, he says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, this is kind of an analogy that's lost on us because um, in, in the time of Jesus, salt had a lot more uh, uses than what is often used today. Uh, you know, sometimes people will say things like, you know, that person is salt of the earth. But when we look at the intended meaning of that phrase, we see that all of it relates to our interaction with those who live around us. So let's look at a few of those. First of all, salt was expensive. It was, it was actually something that was often used in order to make trades. It was used as a form of currency, which means this, that when Christians enter a neighborhood, they ought to bring great value into the place in which they live. That where they go, there ought to be a weightiness, um, a, a kind of transition where when that person enters, something changes in the places in which they live. Not only that, but salt was also used 
Um, it, and it still is used today to enhance flavor, right? We add salt to our food to bring out the flavors, which means that not only are Christians called to do good themselves, but they're called to partner with other followers of Jesus and other um, people in their community who are not followers of Jesus to bring about the common good in their neighborhood. They're called to lift up others, encourage others, be collaborative to see God's goodness enter communities. It's not just something that we do individually. It's something that we do corporately. And then third, um, salt had like um, disinfectant, antiseptic qualities. It was used to treat wounds, to treat infections, which means this. When the world says, when it looks at a neighborhood and it quote unquote says that the neighborhood has gone to hell, Christians look at that community and they enter in with the love of heaven. When everyone else is leaving, Christians enter. If you look at Christian history, some of the most beautiful moments of God's faithfulness were moments when Christians stayed. And that's what we get to be. We get to be a faithful presence in our neighborhood. So as we come together, we see communities as like a hub of life, almost like a base of the gospel that is then sent out to reach the homes around them. So we're going to plan times throughout our year to think together, to work together, to, to find ways to practically love and serve our neighbors. We get to be there for the renewal of our city, to be there for the renewal of our neighborhoods. So that's who we are. That's our mission as a church. Um, in a moment, we're going to close as a, as a community in your social gathering with a, a time of prayer. But before we do, let me just share with you two really quick encouragements. The first encouragement I'd love to share with you is this. Stick with it. If you've been a part of any sort of group or any sort of gathering, you know that there are moments where there's a temptation to leave. Maybe that moment is the moment when um, the group starts to get close, right? At first, we're all kind of strangers. We don't necessarily know one another. We can kind of put up a bit of a facade. But then as time goes on, you know, those masks begin to fall off. There begins to become intimacy within the group. And I know for myself, intimacy, that, that, that fear of being known is very real. And the temptation in that time is, is all too often to pull away. Or it could look like our preferences are, are, are rubbed against, right? If you've been a part of any gathering for long enough, you know you're going to find one person or two people, or however it might be, that don't necessarily um, jive with your kind of preferences. They might grate against your nerves. They might say something that you think, well, I wouldn't say it like that. And in that moment, again, there is a temptation to pull away, to say, hey, you know what? I probably wouldn't hang out with that group of people. Listen, in those moments, the, 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 the option is always to pull away. And of course, this is always invitation, never obligation. You're not required to say by any means, please come to the degree to which you want. But I know this in my life, that the best moments, the moments of real life change don't come before that temptation. They come on the other side of that temptation. So we're going to be gathering from January to June. And I would just say to you, give it six months and watch what God does in your life. And the second encouragement is this. Come to these gatherings with a spirit of grace and patience. This is in many ways um, kind of new to what we're doing as a church. We, we've gathered in communities in COVID time, but coming out of COVID, this is kind of a, a relaunch of the heart and the mission of what we're doing. And because this is something that for many of us is, is a new practice, is a new way of meeting, um, there is going to be hiccups along the way. There is going to be bumps in the road. We're going to try some things that probably aren't going to work. Or your host is going to say something that probably wasn't the right thing to say in the right moment. And I would just say to you, come with a spirit of grace and patience. If we administratively do something, or if your host says something, please don't use that as a reason to pull away from what God is doing. And in that same vein with the, the spirit of grace and patience, we also recognize that communities are something that we see um, as growing, as expanding. We hope to see not just one community in a region, but multiple. And if we're being honest about the growth that we hope for, that means that, that multiplication is inevitable. And if multiplication is inevitable, that means that we might be looking at, at gathering in different spaces at different times. Our groups might split, um, or maybe split's not even the right word, they might multiply and we might see other people come. And I would just ask you to not see those moments as a moment of loss, but see those as a moment of gain because it means that we as a church are growing, both spiritually, both internally and corporately. 
So we come together um, uh, with a spirit of grace and patience, and then we, we, we commit to stick with it and see what God does. Okay, that's all I've got for you today. Um, I can't wait to be with you. You're gonna have another video next week, so I'll see you guys next week, and I'm so excited for what lies ahead. Enjoy the rest of your time together, and we'll see you next week.